So our last speaker is one of the three astrophysicists in the Philippines, an expert on space science and development, a space educator, and a space policy expert. He has worked with different sectors such as the academe, industry, government, and defense sectors for the development, promotion, and utilization of aerospace technology in the Philippines. He is also the program leader of the National Space Development Program and that established the framework, guidelines, and space research and development for the Philippine Space Development Utilization Policy and led the lobbying of the recently signed Philippine Space Act, or RA-11363. He believes that space advancement and space policy is needed in the country and has many applications including the development of disaster resiliency. He was also recognized by the Asian Scientist magazine as one of the top 100 Asian scientists for 2018 and was awarded by the International Astronautical Federation as one of the 2012 Emerging Space Leaders. His topic is about the Philippine space policy and its future implications on disaster risk reduction. Let us all welcome Dr. Rahel Marie Sese. Pleasant good afternoon to everyone. So it's my pleasure to be here in uh, here in front of you to talk something about. I'm sure most of you have already heard, uh, and this uh, with regards to the recent creation of the Philippine Space Agency. But because we are uh, here at uh, NICS and uh, this is uh, under the UP Resilience Institute, uh, we I'm try I'm going to show you how this is going to impact. Uh, the recent creation of the space agency is going to impact, uh, and the policy as well, is going to impact uh, disaster risk reduction management. So Jake and uh, Anthony gave a very good introduction on what is being done right now, but I'm, I'll try to show you on what is in store for the rest of us. So the UN actually has an office with regards to space, and this is the UN Office for Outer Space Affairs. And one of the things that we are, uh, I'm sure we've also heard, is that in 2017, uh, 2015, we had the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, and what the UNOSA did was try to look at what would be the impact of space technology among these 17 SDGs, and it was found out that it was not just one, two, or three SDGs that will be impacted uh, by space technology, but rather all 17 SDGs, and that goes from everywhere from life on land or life below water, climate action. So this shows how space technology is very ubiquitous now in our society, okay? So it has a lot of impact to us. Of course, in terms of application, some of this has been mentioned earlier. Communications is one of the most important and the earliest applications of space technology. But beyond that, we are also using a lot of important things such as positioning and navigation, weather forecasting and environmental observation. So these are the very things that is, uh, that is very important to uh, disaster risk reduction. But of course, in order to develop all of this, we need to develop the technology, understand the underlying science behind it, do the research, and of course, at the long run, explore space. Now, the world has changed a lot in the last 50, 60 years since we started exploring space. Uh, back then, in the 1960s, uh, there were very few countries that were involved in space. Okay, so of course we were, we all know about uh, USSR back then, and you have uh, US as well, who were the main competitors in the space race. But you also have other players like Canada, uh, France, Italy, and uh, United Kingdom or Great Britain. Fast forward to 2016, it is a very different world now. Okay. It's uh, what was once known as the realm of advanced nations, which is space, is it's no longer true because now we have countries, small countries, developing countries such as Bangladesh, Nigeria, Algeria, who are all developing space capabilities. Even in our ASEAN neighborhood, we are all, uh, all our neighbors are developing space capabilities and they have their own space program. This is because of the understanding on how space technology can impact a country not just in terms of the military side or in the defense side but also on the practical side especially in the civilian side or in areas such as disaster risk reduction okay this so here in our country we have a lot of benefits in terms of uh, having a national space program okay first and foremost of that as I mentioned earlier is the defense and security aspect because 
when you look at the history of space, it all evolved or it came from the military side. So that's a natural application and uh, that's inherently dual use nature of space. However, you have more practical applications such as disaster management. So what was demonstrated earlier, uh, we can use satellites now for communications, especially in times during uh, disasters. And this has been very evident during Typhoon Haiyan or Typhoon Yolanda, which was mentioned by Cherik earlier. Uh, I, that was one of the major turning points in the Philippines. Uh, realization on the part of the government that we need to develop space capabilities, not because we want to do it for mainly for research, but because there are a lot of pra pra practical applications that can benefit society. So, of course, that includes also beyond communication, that includes having satellite imagery to know the extent of the damage that is. Uh, uh, caused by a typhoon, by a tsunami, or by an earthquake, and then you have all these sorts, all other applications in sp uh, of uh, space program. Okay, so you have environment and land use monitoring. So you having a detailed map of the Philippines, a nationwide map of the Philippines, uh, would enable us to know which areas would be hazardous to developing structures. So we no longer build structures in that area, and which areas would be prone to. Uh, other types of hazards. Okay. Uh, I will skip this because this was mentioned already earlier. So as of now, we have three micro, uh, three satellites. You have uh, the Duwata One, Duwata Two, and the uh, Maya One. And uh, this has been discussed earlier. So these are our main tools or our main uh, assets in space right now that provides us with in, not just with imagery but also with communication capabilities using the amateur radio unit. So for us here in the Philippines, we have very limited access to space. So we have, uh, as I said, uh, what was mentioned, we only have three satellites right now, but of course, this is going to increase in the future. Uh, we're very much reliant on foreign satellites, especially when you talk about commercial satellite communication. Okay? We no longer have our own telecommunication satellite. We used to have one, the Aguila 2, but it was no longer uh, owned by the Philippines and it was eventually decommissioned. We have a very small, a small but growing pool of experts in the country. So it is, a lot of them are part of the Stamina for Space or the Film Microsat program in the past. But also we have experts who are dealing with pro image processing in agriculture, in forestry, in uh, marine science, and other fields. And because of this, we have a very small R&D and industry as well. But the industry right now is growing. We have an Aerospace Industry Association of the Philippines, which from 11 companies in 2014, there are now about 50 companies now uh, to date. So it's uh, increasing as well. And, well, in the past, we don't have uh, space policy or agency, but this is no longer true because right now the Philippines is the youngest nation in the world that has its own space agency. So uh, we start uh, mentioned that earlier. So right now we have the crown as being the youngest space nation in the world. And this is by virtue of Republic Act 11363, or the Philippine Space Act. So this uh, landmark legislation, uh, which was, uh, well, the, the crafting of this took three years of pre, pre-crafting and three years of pure legislation work or lobbying work. So this establishes the creation of the Philippine Space Agency as well as the Philippine Space Development and Utilization Policy. Because it was realized in the early stages that we need to have both the agency and the policy at the same time. So this was signed in August 8, uh, last to have, oh, last, just last August 8, 2019, and is now considered as the, by, by virtue of this act, the FILSA is established as a central government agency addressing all national issues and activities related to space science and technology applications. So you can easily Google this uh, official gazette, just uh, type in RA11363. Central to the app is the Philippine Space Development and Utilization Policy, which is the primary strategic roadmap for national space development in the next day, decade. So the idea is that within the next 10 years, this or after 10 years, this policy will be modified or will be amended to take into account newer technologies and newer geopolitical realities. So uh, this will be the main focus, the focusing on areas on space science and technology applications that would address national issues and concerns. And under the space policy, we have six, what we call six key development areas, national security and, and development, 
hazard management and climate studies, space research and development, space industry capacity building, space education and awareness, and international cooperation. So each of these are in the statements of the bill or in the law. So I, I won't read through all of them in the interest of time, but I'll focus more on the hazard management and climate study. So you can see here that even in this early stages of crafting the space policy, it was a very uh, early realization for us that one of the biggest benefits of having a space program is in terms of disaster risk reduction, hazard management, and climate study. So it says here, I can't see it. Yeah. The Philippines will develop and utilize space science and technology applications uh, to enhance the hazard management and disaster mitigation strategy, as well as ensure the nation's resiliency to climate change. So this is what is written in the uh, law right now. Okay, So it shows here how the space technology, how the space agency can provide a very huge impact to the disaster uh, community in terms of providing satellite images, providing capabilities in terms of communications during uh, reduction, both in the pre-disaster and post-disaster stages. So just uh, another, a few more things uh, regarding the Philippine Space Agency. So of course to implement the policy there has to be a government agency that will do that and that is the Philippine Space Agency. And the idea here is that the Philso is a primary policy planning, coordinating and administrative entity of the executive branch and on, on anything regarding space. Okay, So you can see here the different functions and what is different compared to what how other countries did it or how most developing countries uh, did uh, their space programs, the, Phil the PhilSA is an attached agency directly under the office of the president. Okay, So this is based on a stakeholder consultation in the past where it was realized that due to the cross-cutting application of space, it is much better to put it under the office of the president. And also in the future, uh, there is a site uh, for FILSA, there's uh, also provi provided in the law that 30 hectares of land is going to be provided for FILSA in the new Clark City, somewhere in Clark Capas area, okay, in the northern part. So it's outside. So that will be served as the main headquarters. So for us that uh, were part of the Na National Space Development Program, our role was to create the different roadmaps. So we have actually crafted four different uh, roadmaps for the future. One is the Space Research and Development Agenda. Uh, so it shows here that Earth observation for the environment is one of the main applications. So we saw, we realized that the primary importance of space technology in terms of disaster risk reduction, and that is very much entrenched right now in our own space policy. We also uh, put, off, put forward the proposal for the Satellite Development Roadmap, so beyond the Diwata series, based on stakeholder consultation, what would be the other satellites that the Philippines will need. And in the, what we found out is that there are other two other uh, telecommunication satellites and three Earth observation satellites that is going to be needed by the country. So one of them is uh, going to be in the radar domain because of the cloudy weather that we have here. Uh, sometimes we, get very, uh, we have uh, very nice pictures of clouds, but uh, using radar satellites, this can eventually penetrate cloud cover. <coughs> then you also have the satellite data sharing policy. Basically what this says is that all the information, all the images that will be obtained using Philippine-based satellites or Philippine satellites will be open to public for free, to government agencies to have them for free after it has been cleared and after uh, technology protection measures have been already put uh, put in place. So you no longer have to pay for satellite images in the future as long as they are coming from Philippine satellites. And I think this is already being done uh, because the, the uh, engineer Mark Stupas who crafted the satellite data sharing policy also did the same policy for the Diwata 1 and the Diwata 2 program. So plan in elevate lang. And then you have the industry development roadmap on which areas that the Philippines will venture into in the future. It's subsystem production, developing new satellites here, like what well, the Stamina for Space team is doing. But in, beyond that, we also need to do, develop a lot of applications because once we have the data coming in, we have to utilize this data and help make use of them, uh, study them, and make sure that 
we can, it is beneficial. It's not just a pretty picture, but something that is useful for local government units, for academic researchers, for uh, foresters, agriculturists, and so on. Okay? And then the last one is the launch vehicle services in the future. Okay? So it shows here that in terms of using space technology for climate change adaptation, mitigation, and disaster risk reduction, there are a lot of impacts, uh, a lot of benefits. It's, it can either be atmospheric, oceanic, or terrestrial. Okay? So basically, anything that you can put in space can image every surface of the Earth uh, given enough time. Okay? So you have things like, uh, in terms of the applications of Earth observation satellites, and this is where we are going to go forward in the future, using sat Earth observation satellites, uh, not just uh, those that are already available right now, but also those coming from future Philippine satellites as well, uh, for geohazard risk monitoring, uh, national carbon accounting, drought monitoring, forest monitoring, algal bloom detection is also very important. And siguro for us, hindi masyad important in CIS monitoring. Wala naman tayong uh, CIS here, okay? So forest cover monitoring, having a data on or information how much forest cover the country is uh, any given time on a quarterly basis is a very important uh, thing for us. So, siguro, uh, not just forest cover, but even agricultural maps would also provide that uh, very useful information. This is one example of uh, from a commercial satellite. So, this is a uh, oil spill detection, and this was, uh, I think, uh, a few years ago, about three years ago. And uh, I, I was given this image by a colleague of mine from, from Italy. And what they found out is that using radar satellite imagery, they found out that there were, there were oil, not really oil spills, but oil slicks that were happening in, uh, uh, in Sulu Sea, okay? That even the DNR was not aware that they, it was there. And that is not a small spill. The total land area that was, there were five oil, spill, oil slicks, uh, which covered about an area of uh, around 25 square kilometers. So that's quite big, okay? Uh, so this shows you the value of satellite image because you can never, you cannot hide even with clouds you can see something uh, such as this. So these are the different oil slicks, uh, five of them, located in different areas. So the, mainly the source of these are uh, the maritime ships that were dumping oil in open sea. Okay, so and this is something that uh, apparently it's a practice in the maritime industry, but. Without satellite technology, we have no means of monitoring this. And this is one, uh, imagine this is already, this is all passing through Sulu Sea, which is very close to uh, the Tubataha uh, region, uh, to the Tubataha Reef. So there would be a potential impact if this goes uh, uh, unmonitored, okay? There are also other applications of space technology for uh, climate change and adaptation in DRR. Of course, this includes detection for mining sites and environmental impact in the future. So uh, I, I gave this talk a couple of months, a few months ago to the mining industry and uh, apparently they were both happy and unhappy. There are no capability on satellites. That they were happy that they would know how, they are much, how much they are progressing in terms of mining, but they are also unhappy because now the uh, government regulators would also know how much they are progressing. So it's a, I, know, I don't know whether that was a good or bad talk in, uh, that I told them about that. Uh, but then it's a reality uh, that uh, you can uh, image, and, and I've seen some even uh, images of uh, security in brief, in security briefings about uh, satellite images that shows where the Abu Sayyaf are hiding in Basilan, okay? Because you can see the structures that they built in the middle of the mountains. And that has an, another application as well on the security side. For sea surface temperature, of course, this is very important for us. We're a maritime nation. Um, we, sea surface temperature is highly correlated to, uh, to, fish, uh, to, uh, to fisheries, okay? So knowing where the fishes are, would increase the economic output as well of uh, our fishermen. But at the same time, this can also be a tool for scientists and for policymakers in saying that, okay, you've done enough fishing for this area, okay, fish in another area because 
so that this this certain area would now recover okay and then of course in rapid disaster assessment as what have been demonstrated during typhoon Haiyan. okay so this has been one of the biggest example on uh, on using satellite images for for disaster assessment. Unfortunately, back then, the problem was that there was a deluge of data coming from foreign countries because we activated the UN Charter. Uh, unfortunately, there was no mechanism yet back then on how these data will be processed, who will manage the data, who will process the data, who will transmit it to the LGU, to the decision makers, and so on. So. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why it was seen that uh, one of the roles that the space agency will play in the future. So hopefully with this very short talk, I was able to show you that uh, the, the future um, of uh, disaster risk reduction is we really need to use more uh, space technology, not just satellite images, or not just communication, but also to understand and analyze this. And this is where the academics, uh, researchers, and scientists would have to come in. We have to make sense out of all these data that we are getting from satellites. We have to translate them into useful information that can be used by policymakers so that we can improve our DRR strategy in the future. So I'll end my talk with a quotation, which uh, not from a scientist, but from a journalist. And it says here, basically it says something about why we are doing space and what is really the goal of uh, doing space technology. And it says here, the question to ask is whether the risk of traveling to space is worth the benefit. The answer is an unequivocal yes, but not only for the reasons that are usually touted by the space community. The need to explore the scientific return and the possibility of commercial profit. The most compelling reason, the very long-term one, is the necessity of using space to protect Earth and guarantee the survival of humanity. Thank you very much.